Hello, it's Ren Presents Time. I'm your host, Ren, and today we continue with the Belmont Saga, Part 1, Chapter 7, Standoff. So last week, after a long absence from the story, the last time we'd seen Lieutenant Gwendolyn was at the end of Part 1 of the previous book, she is back. She calms in, and the Seeker is acting fairly normal with the lantern sitting there on the missives panel. The comm systems work, the sensors work to a limited degree because a lot of the sensors have been removed. But uh, the comm comes in, it's Lieutenant Gwendolyn. Paymaster Stenstrom expects her to be angry and belligerent like she was last time. But instead of that, she is uh, apologetic. She says, I'm sorry. For the way I acted. It was rude and I, I I guess I have a hot temper after all and it got the better of me and I, and I didn't mean for that to happen. And they make up and become tacit friends even though Gwendolyn's orders are to cost Paymaster Stenstrom his chair. She lets him know, I, hey, I, I, I have no desire to do this. It's just, it is what it is and I have to do my duty, but it doesn't mean I have to like it. And I, and I really hope after all this is over, we can sit down and, and shake hands. And maybe I can help you out in your next assignment. He says, well, I appreciate that, but you're, you're not getting aboard my ship. Well, in this chapter, they actually meet in space. The much faster, fully functional Demophilon John, commanded by Lieutenant Gwendolyn, arrives at the Seeker's location. The Seeker's making very slow but pretty steady progress it's if at this rate they will make their 12 day deadline just barely but still but now here's Gwendolyn and if she gets aboard the ship not only does it cost Paymaster Stenstrom his chair but according to the Baz Vendetta curse that Tara insists is real they could all die so it's imperative she not get aboard the ship anywho Let's proceed immediately. This is going to be a fairly short chapter, and normally I would just go on to the next one, but the next one is huge. So no, you can't, can't do that. Just have to have a, a short reading this time. In any event, let's proceed right now. It was the slowest chase in League history. The huge but limping warboard Seeker against the fully functional but much smaller Demophilon John. The Seeker was big and swan-like, graceful and menacing, but she was darkened and mostly dead. She was flying backwards. Her lone mode of power being supplied by the Westminster strapped down and forward facing Ripcar Bay number 5. Stenstrom could see the scout ship on the hollow cone, a jumpy, blurry image. Well, right on time, he said. He went to his office and gazed out the windows to get a clearer look. Tara, get in here. Tara rejoined him on the run. There she was, swooping in from 12.45 p.m., the Demophilon John. She was a standard tackle-class scout ship, about 300 feet long. Its structure consisted of an elliptical disc five decks high, buttressed by three evenly spaced convex cylinders roughly shaped like bananas, hence the Tekel's long-standing nickname, the Banana Boat. The upper conning run was shorter than the lower two and buttressed with a tail assembly. She was nimbly orbiting around the length of the Seeker, looking it over. She was lit up in service lights, scanning cones, and glowing windows. Stenstrom thought he could see occasional movement in the windows, people passing by, and he wondered if Lieutenant Gwendolyn was looking out of one of them even now. She stuck in Tara's closed vendetta circle, just like he was, maybe. Tara, he said, what are we looking at here? Well, it's just a run-of-the-mill Tekel-class scout ship. It's a fairly fast boat, got four J-400 Stellar Mach coils, but those are pretty small. If we were normal, they couldn't keep up with us at full sail, but we're not normal right now, are we? What's its armament? It has six XMASS rim-fired armor-tip caseless chain guns mounted forward. 
Those are Christmas guns, right? I remember hearing about those. Yep, just a fast-firing light gun. Got punch, but we're pretty heavily armored. How badly can that type of gun hurt us? Well, they can do a fair amount of topical damage, but that's all. A Christmas gun's not going to put a warbird out of commission. Why? Are you afraid Captain Gwendolyn's going to shoot us up? Well, she might. I'm thinking she's going to do the following. I'm thinking she's going to try and land several rip cars first, and then she's going to try and dock, and then she's going to go for the Westminster, light it up and shut us down. That's what I'd do. He looked over his shoulder. Hey, Ram, do you have a good reading on your home displays? I do. I see her orbiting around, trying to casually lock on and dock using automated signaling. It won't work, as we don't have power to those automated systems. It'll be like making love to a dead man. Well, don't lock it till you've tried it, Aram, Tara replied. Keep her at bay, Stenstrom said, and feel free to give her a little lub tap if she comes in too close. He gazed at the Demophilon John floating around outside. You once said there was someone aboard that ship that I care deeply over, Tara. I don't recall saying that. You did, back when we first put the molly on. Huh. No clue. They shook on it and returned to the bridge. How are we looking, Bell? Aram asked. Slow. How are we doing for maneuverability? We're fine. We can maneuver with a scout ship any day. We just can't outrun her. The comm crackled on the bridge. Paymaster Stenstrom, came Gwendolyn's voice. So... Here we are, sir. Are you feeling thirsty? The sooner I board, the sooner I'm buying you an ale back at the fleet. She said in a good-natured manner. Nah, Captain, I'm good, I think, he replied. Well then, fair hunting, she said, and the comm clicked off. Aram, the only two places she's going to be able to dock is dead forward and to the starboard off the neck, right? Right. Tara answered for him. Very well. Keep the nose and the starboard side away from her. You are free to maneuver however you see fit. Gotcha, Bell, Aram said, tugging on the wheel. Just remember, keep clear of the damn belt. No need to test fate. Uh, agreed. She didn't sound mad or nothing, Bell, Tara said with a hint of disappointment. Not like before. We smooth things out. She doesn't seem like a half-bad person, really, but I'm still not letting her aboard the bloody ship. So you're not going to fight? I rather doubt it. Well, I was hoping to watch a good fight, and I think she would have beaten the daylights out of you, if you really want my thoughts. Well, thanks, Tara. Aram looked into his screen. Reading four small vessels exiting the ship. Ripcar's bell, they're coming in fast. Stenstrom saw the flickering images on the holocone. Which one is she in, Tara, can you tell? The one that's heading for Ripcar Bay number 7. Right. Aram, don't worry about the rest of them. Track that one heading for number 7 and keep her from docking. The other ones are just decoys. Aram spun the wheel. The Ripcars from Demophilon John chased the Seeker around for a while. Though the small ships were relatively fast and maneuverable, they weren't as fast as the Seeker with its Westminster drive engine. Even though the Seeker had no stellar speed available to her to fare the deep stars and was flying backwards, she was faster at maneuvering speeds than the Demophilon John. It was like a pigeon being chased by a slightly slower swarm of bees. Aram kicked the bar and the Seeker outpaced them. After a time, the rip cars gave up and returned to the Demophilon John. Well, that had to be humbling for her, Stenstrom said. Now that her rip car gambit has failed miserably, I think she's now going to try and hard dock the ship. Sure enough, the Demophilon John tried to slide in first to the front of the ship and then to the starboard. But even in a diminished state, the Seeker was fairly light on the helm, and Aram, with a bit of doing, kept the scouting ship at bay, matching it turn for turn. The two ships performed a swirling dance, the scouting ship moving one way and the Seeker matching. 
You didn't think I'd just let you up and knock on the front door, did you, Captain? Stenstrom asked. Gwendolyn's voice came back on the comm. You can twist away all you want, Belle. Where are you going to go? I can outrun you with one coil and lock. At this speed, you've got a ten-day trip to Baz ahead of you, and you have to sleep sometime. Me, I've got the night bell to take over when I get tired. You might just wake up and find me smiling down at you. Aha, Tara said. See? Stenstrom laughed as Aram pulled on the wheel. Ah, uh, but haven't you heard, Captain? I've got Tyrol sorcery. I don't need to sleep. I can brew up a potion to defeat the need for sleep. Oh, Tyrol sorcery isn't real. Oh yeah? You think so? There was a silence over the calm then. Bell, is everybody on the bridge? Yes. Why do you ask? Because I'm thinking about running out a Christmas gun and shooting out your engine. I just wanted to make sure everyone's safe and whole on the bridge before I do it. I thought you said you weren't going to do that. Well, I thought you said you wouldn't mind if I did. You might want to think twice about shooting my engine. My engine is the tax scout ship Westminster. If you shoot her out, you'll be willfully destroying a fleet vessel. Oh, but a couple rounds, just a hole or two. She'll be fine after I board and patch her up. Stenstrom laughed. But, uh, Captain, you're not giving me enough credit for having a devious mind. I figured you'd try such a thing, so I rigged the messminster with a shaped charge of shout out. You run out a Christmas gun and light her up, she'll blow hard. I see. And where did you get a shape charge of shout out that's not usually found in any quantity on a half scuttled ship? I borrowed it from Dry Dock 275, a virtual grocery store, that one. On the hollow cone, Gwendolyn put her hand to her chin and thought, Hmm. The two ships continued spiraling around each other, the Demophilon John darting in and the Seeker matching the move. After an hour or two, Gwendolyn calmed back in. So what are we going to do here, Belle? You can't get away from me, and I can't dock. I don't want you to exhaust yourselves needlessly. May I please make a suggestion? Shoot. Why don't we dock, and you come aboard my ship? I promise I won't try to board. Then you and I can, between ourselves, see if we can come up with a fair way to settle this. Well, how do you propose we do that? We'll have a contest of some sort. We'll, we'll play cards. I don't know how to play cards. Well, I'll teach you a game. Something simple. I'm certain you'd be a natural. And I should think you'd have beginner's luck on your side. You win, you get to go to Bass. I'll even help pull your ship along, allow it to pick up a little speed. And if I win, you let me come aboard and we head back to the fleet. Tara shook her head and butted in. No, 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 no. You don't settle something important with a game of cards. You got an issue to settle? You fight it out and let me watch. Come on, Captain, you can take Bell here. Gwendolyn looked at Tara somewhat incredulous. She seemed for a moment like she was going to get mad, and then she composed herself. Uh, quite the little thing, aren't you, uh, Private? I am. So you two going to fight it out or not? One of her crewmen handed Gwendolyn a report. She looked at it and appeared concerned. Belle, in all seriousness, we've drifted off the shipping lanes. I ask that we bear to 9.45 p.m. and get back into the patrolled regions. There's a whole lot of nothing out here. Moving this slow and all and drifting off the lanes is dangerous. That's how ships and people end up missing. Well, sorry I'm cramping your style, Captain. Tara muted the calm and pointed at the lantern. Fun and games aside, Bell, she's right. We're drifting awfully close to the belt. Gwendolyn continued. It's all right. Come on, follow me back into the lanes. And for creation state, stop calling me captain. We're past that already. Once we're back in the lanes, we can continue this. And I really think we should dock. 
and you come aboard my ship. If you don't board, I'm still thinking about using a Christmas gun on you, so keep that in mind. In the meantime, follow me. Tara looked into her sensing visor. Well, the Demophilon John is turning away to 9.45 p.m., Bell. Very well, Aram. Go ahead and follow her. Just make sure she doesn't try something funny along the way. Aram adjusted his stance and made to turn the wheel. Uh, hey, uh, Bell. Something's resisting me. I I'm having trouble. Are we breaking down? Stenstrom asked. I don't know. I don't think so. It just doesn't want to turn. Tara looked at her visor. Bell, I'm reading a large gravity well forming to our ventral. It it's pulling us down. Gwendolyn's voice filtered back over the comm. What are you doing, Bell? Quick loitering back there. I'm not going to try anything until we get back into the shipping lanes. I'm not certain where it's coming from, Gwen, but we're falling into a gravity well forming at our 6 a.m. The comm hollow flickered. Gwendolyn sounded alarmed. I'm reading it too. I don't see anything on our charts indicating the presence of such a thing in this region of space. Look, Belle, you need to let me dock and take you out of there. It, it might not be safe. The lights on the bridge flickered and then went out for a moment, except for the lantern which burned steady and true. And then they all heard a cold voice. Tara. It said. Oh, not now, for creation's sake, Stenstrom yelled. There was a clank and the lights flickered. B Bell, the Westminster has just shut down, Tara said. The, the helm has gone dead right along with it, Bell, Aram added. Bell, Gwendolyn cried, her voice crackling over the flickering cone. Your ship is fading from my screens. Enough of this, Bell. We're boarding to get you three out of there. We've played this game long enough. I want you out of there now. Something enveloped them. B Bell! And the Seeker vanished. And with that, we conclude Part 1, Chapter 7, Standoff. So, that little chapter, we see Gwendolyn trying to get on the ship. And then we see Stenstrom trying to uh, avoid her seduction, so to speak. Fun little chapter, a little maneuvering here and there. And they're sort of at a standoff because even though the seeker is in a bad shape it can still maneuver and it can maneuver pretty well and so in the there's only a few places the demophilon john can dock and they just keep those places away from the demophilon john the seeker even though it's very large and he heavily armored ship is really light on the helm and really fast. Captain Davidge, when he piloted the Seeker, used that to his advantage a lot. And Aram, to his credit, is doing quite well, keeping St uh, Gwendolyn from boarding the ship. And then at the end there, something crazy happens. A gravity well forms, and the Seeker starts blinking out of space and time. For whatever reason and they hear a ghostly voice like they've been hearing in the back of the ship and then that's it fun little chapter next chapter is a pivotal one we're gonna learn a lot of stuff we're gonna learn what the hell has been going on for a long time we're gonna learn the true nature of lily we're gonna learn who's pulling Lily's strings. We're going to learn who's pulling Lord Belmont's strings. And on and on. It's, and this is a long-assed chapter. How the hell long is it? You would think a competent writer would have put a chapter break in here. But you don't got one. You got me. So this goes from 436 to page 454. So it's almost 20 pages. That's not quite as long as I thought, but that's a long one. And I'm going to break my usual method here. I'm not going to tell you the name of the next chapter because that will give away too damn much. You're just going to have to wait until next week. We're going to learn a lot, 
It's going to be cool. It's going to be funky. And it, um, a lot of the questions that have been dangling since book one in this series are going to be answered, unlike Ahsoka from the miserable hacks at Lucasfilm who answer nothing. That's just a quick commentary on my part. Because when you create a series on TV or streaming and you have absolutely no plot, you, there's no questions to be answered. And then you turn one of the greatest villains ever created, one of the most cunning minds of all time in literary form, and turn him into a dumbass who makes the same mistakes over and over again, has no plan, has no chutzpah, is, a, is out of shape with a paunch, and just can't seem to do anything right. Yeah. Yeah, you, you got nothing. Anyways, enough of that. Next week, we will continue to Chapter 8. The name of the chapter is, at this time, undisclosed, because the author gave away too much in the title of the chapter so we'll find out next week and it's going to be cool until then this is ren presents i am your host ren peace out